Welcome back to the 205th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including two that talk about different forms of censorship coming from different sides of the aisle, and a interesting article talking about how the NRA still has some political power in Washington, even though it may not appear to be the case. And of course, we'll end today with our Daily Delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. And before we get to our daily debate, just want to say Happy New Year to everybody. I'm recording this a little bit ahead of time, but I know it's coming out on the 1st, so Happy New Year. Hope it was amazing for everyone that was involved, and let's just hope those resolutions start off nice and strong. So, with all that said, let's jump into our daily debate. So why do we live in a world where censorship and limiting of speech and expression are so common? I think it's because we have lots of different institutions that have been set up in a very particular way, and they are being directly undermined by both sides of the aisle, and they're trying to cause large cultural shifts. And when either side tries to make a big shift, guess what? The other side doesn't like it, and they don't want to hear that opinion. They don't want to see that shift in culture. So the best way to not think about it, to not have it expressed, is to limit the dissemination of the information, limit the speech of people who are trying to talk about these sort of things. That's why I think that we see a lot of censorship efforts from both sides of the aisle, or at least limitation on both sides of the aisle. But if you have a different opinion, throw it down there in the comment section. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say on that one. So, speaking about this different uh, censoring uh, opinions or different views of censorship from the left and the right, we have our first article that comes from Just the News. And it is it has the headline, Journalists, Medical Groups, Big Business Emerge as Biden Allies in Social Media Censorship Case. So, you may be thinking, whoa, wait, hold on, what do, you, what do you mean? All these different groups are coming out on the side of Biden and they're they're actually coming out on the side of censorship. That's what Just the News is trying to angle at here. They're trying to talk about the spread of misinformation, disinformation, or just the sharing of particular opinions on different social media platforms. As you may know, President Biden has and let's be clear, Trump did it too during his administration. Obama did it as well. They have certain advisors or people who are on the watch out. They go out and they talk to social media companies saying, we're really concerned about this certain uh, topic that's being talked about really heavily. Or well, maybe you should consider doing X, Y, and Z. And when it comes from the government, it doesn't necessarily inherently have a threat in it. But if they're the only organization, institution in the country that can actually forcibly make you do something or restrict your market or restrict what you can do as a business, as a company, so on and so forth, well, these social media companies are going to listen up and say, oh, well, no, they were being nice about it, but maybe we should listen because if we don't do something about it on our own, they may use the force of government to do it and they may do it in a way that we don't necessarily like. That's what uh, the conversation has been about when it comes to Biden talking with these different social media platforms and people on the right saying, hey, whoa, 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 you are directly using your government influence in order to limit certain types of speech that you don't agree with. And that's probably going to end up more affecting the right. There have been some people on the left who also don't like that certain types of free speech are being limited or at least appear to be limited. So that's why this case is really, really important. And I'm going to read you the first two paragraphs or uh, first three paragraphs from this article because it'll set up what I'm talking about and really provide the present context rather than the historical context that I just outlined for you. Quote, President Joe Biden's administration is getting some big name allies in its defense against a landmark free speech infringement lawsuit. Their argument, protecting Americans from indirect censorship by government officials undermines the First Amendment, national security, and public health. So let's review that. Protecting Americans from indirect censorship by government officials undermines the First Amendment. So wait, hold on. You're saying that stopping Americans, and let's be clear, this is just the news spin on it, but stopping Americans from having the government say or at least suggest what should or not should or should not be allowed to take off in the algorithm or should be suppressed in some way or not is actually a limitation on the First Amendment. Let's go on from what they're saying here. Quote, advocacy groups for journalists, academics, doctors, technologists, 
and big business and a powerful senator made various forms of arguments in friend of the court briefs or amicus briefs to the Supreme Court in the days before and after Christmas. The justices are evaluating the broad view of state action. And when they say state action here, they're not talking about, oh, Virginia action or California action. They're talking about government as the state, the nation as the quote unquote state adopted by the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, which found that the White House, Surgeon General, CDC, FBI, and Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or the CISA, likely violated the First Amendment by pressuring and conjoling tech platforms to suppress disfavored narratives. So, if you want to make the argument in, let's jump back to the first part of the quote, where I really took a second to break down what they're saying about protecting Americans from indirect censorship by the government, so on and so forth. They're saying, oh, well, that's going to breach the, it's going to undermine and breach the First Amendment. I think their case on that one is contradictory. I don't agree. Now, national security. I think that you could very well make an argument for that one. But at the same time, I think that if you <laughs> if you allow this sort of goat in, I don't want to say scapegoat, but yeah, we'll say scapegoat. If you let this sort of term in as a scapegoat to say, well, hey, we're protecting national security. What isn't going to fall under national security? What what can you not try to flip into national security? Because right now they'll argue, well, hey, we don't want Russian and Chinese bots spreading disinformation on the platforms because that's going to undermine the elections. It's going to undermine confidence in the government. That is going to hurt national security. Well, what if there's a really vital product that uh, a company is making that is subsidized by the government and Somebody makes a bad review about it on social media, and uh, we're trying to make sure that this product is not just sold in the U.S., but across the world. And since the government helped fund it, they are at least, they care a little bit about its economic uh, viability and its ability to sell and make back money. Well, guess what? If someone writes a bad review, and then that may, they could argue, hey, well, no, this is bad information about it. We don't want this person spreading this information because it's going to make people not buy it here in America, which means we wasted tax dollars on it. It also means that people across the world may not buy it, which is going to hurt our national security, the economic position that we have put ourselves in because we helped fund this invention. I know that sounds like it's really far out there, but this is exactly what happens in countries that have nationalized industries. It becomes a little bit harder, or just products that are heavily subsidized by the government it becomes a little bit harder to criticize them because the government is making direct infrastructure investments or direct monetary investments into them. So then any criticism could be seen as undermining the government's effort to help these companies sprout up. So you could argue it's a national security issue. And then the public health aspect of it. Public health is a very wide spanning kind of term. It used to just mean oh, public health when it comes down to the fitness of the population, uh, its ability to fight viruses, things like this. But but now people could say that mental health is part of the public health. And if you're spreading information that is going to cause distress to people because they don't want to deal with reality or simply because it's distressing information, but it's true and it affects people's mental health, they could argue, well, that's actually going to undermine public health. You see how all these terms, they're no longer anchored in something solid. They're being used very broadly. And they can be, the thing is, they're so broad and they're so, I don't want to say unmoored, but they are so simple that many, many different visions of what they actually mean can be read into them. So it could be 10 years down the road, and an executive order goes through that this needs to be protected, this blank needs to be protected for public health. And it, when it came out, the president at the time gave a very specific definition of public health. But guess what? As time moves on, definitions change, or it could even be that it's not talked about the exact same way so they can redefine it in the future because it serves their political goals. That's why specific terms are very, very important, not broad, overly... I mean, let's be clear, in the legal sense, most of these words do have definitions and they do have precedent behind them, so on and so forth. But when talking about it in a more cultural sense, these words and phrases can shift over time. Whether or not we like it, and we may try as hard as we can to keep them at the same definitions, they, they do shift and they can be misconstrued and used in ways that enable people to fill out their own agenda. So 
that's why I think that this sort of language that was being used in the case and this kind of, I don't want to say uh, mischaracterization, but this really simple version that Just the News put in here, that's exactly why they put it in here. Because if I'm reading it just like this, it's, wow, okay, I see a whole bunch of issues like that. There's not a direct quote, so that's not coming directly from the court case, but they definitely use these terms. I have read a few different articles where they use these terms in some of the different quotes. So, you can see how this would be a issue. And this is why it's important for the U.S. Supreme Court to take up something like this to put one, to analyze the merit of the argument. It, does it actually you know, infringe uh, First Amendment, national security, uh, public health, but also to elaborate because in order to actually say whether or not this could affect any of those things, they have to more down, they have to nail down what the definition of those things are. And that's what's going to be really important here. The precedent that they're setting on the case itself, but also the terms being used are extremely, extremely important. And that's why legal cases, they, you know, they use very specific terms so that it can lock it down for years upon years to come. And eventually it could be overturned. They could change the definition, but this could set the standard for the next 30 years, especially going into an age when social media is going to be ever more present. Remember, for social media, we're just in the first 20 years of it. Well, remember what was happening within the first 20 years of the car? We didn't even have seatbelts and things of this nature. We were still sometimes using hand cranks. Things weren't necessarily the safest. Not all cars had roll bars. You know, it's been over 100 plus, I mean, even like 120 years from the very basic cars, and maybe even 140 from the very, very basic cars. So we're in the infancy of the social media age. We're still trying to figure out how the best way to go about it is. So this could set a very strong precedent, a line in the sand saying, no, government, you need to be out of this all together. And depending on how they get to that conclusion, I'm all for it. If they're going to say that, government, you have no interest in this whatsoever, I, I like that. My libertarian side is like, yeah, yeah, hey, keep them out of it. But the part of me that does understand the legitimate threats from outside countries, outside bad actors, or just bad actors within our own nation that are trying to sow dissent and put information out there that is going to uh, negatively infect the populace or the people using social media, that still resonates. Now, do I think that there are options to limit that sort of thing within the private sector, such as like community notes or more stringent versions of community notes? For sure. But that doesn't mean that I'm not susceptible to at least hearing out and engaging in the conversation of government at least maybe setting some regulations or redefining 230 so that either the platform that you're using, the social media platform, is actually a platform where anything can go out there, anything can be put out there, and they can't take it off because they also can't be liable or are they a publisher where all of these social media companies have to deeply regulate? They have to go through and get rid of anything that they don't want to be liable for because they are actually publishing the material rather than hosting a place where people publish their own material. I think if the government wants to get involved with that conversation and redefine things after this ruling, sure. But getting directly into what kind of information can get out there, that is extremely tricky and it does not end well, especially when you have your political opponents in office. If it was Donald Trump doing this right now, that would be a problem for Democrats. And the fact that Joe Biden's doing it right now, that's why it's a currently a problem for Republicans. And if there's an independent in there, it might be a problem for everybody. It could be a problem for nobody. The point is, do you really want to allow these powers to exist when you are not the person in charge? Always think about when you are not in power. If you're okay with it happening, even when you're not in power, then it's probably something that's not that bad. If you are against it and, you know, you're not in power, it's going to be used against you. And then the people that are in power, using this time when they are in power to actually exert their will, they need to stop and think, hey, what happens when I am not in control anymore? Because it's going to come back to bite them in the butt. We've seen this for Democrats, and we've also seen this for Republicans. When you break down the norms, and let's be clear, I understand that breaking down norms, changing things, is a way that society progresses, but especially when it comes to the stringent norms within our political institutions, they are there for a reason, and they need to be broken with extreme care and delicacy and reformed with the exact same thing in mind, not just political expediency, which is, I don't like this opinion, therefore it can't happen. So watch out for the ruling on this case. It's going to be a really, really interesting one. I think it's probably going to come down maybe like 7 
two, maybe six three, probably you know six three is maybe safe. Even five four, I think that maybe Robert uh, Roberts could possibly uh, jump, or maybe even Amy Coney Barrett. I, I honestly don't know because I don't know their uh, legal philosophies as uh, thoroughly as I should. But the reason I say that it is probably gonna be could be seven two is because Katanji Brown Jackson has really looked at the originalist interpretations of the Constitution before. So there's been times when she's actually come down on the side of the uh, conservative justices. So we'll see how that one comes out. So like I said, look out for all that stuff. We're going to jump to our second article. It's also about a different form of censorship. It comes from Slate. And the headline reads, Book bans will never accomplish what parents want them to. Here's why the GOP operatives leading them don't care. So yeah, anybody who has been astute, or I take that back, you don't even have to be astute nowadays. You just have to be semi-conscious, and you've probably heard about this conversation about different states limiting the types of books that can be in public uh, school libraries. And that's why, you know, obviously Slate, like I acknowledge that Just the News kind of twisted things within their first few paragraphs. Slate also twists some things here. They're not direct book bans. They are curation. And I know that's falling into the, the language that the right uses. But if anything, if you don't want to use the word curation, it's just saying certain books aren't allowed into libraries. An outright book ban, a book ban would be saying, no, no, this book is not allowed to be sold in Florida whatsoever. Rather, they're saying that this book will not be available in school libraries. And there are lots of different arguments. There's the one that, hey, this isn't necessary in order to teach in schools. The other one is, hey, it may be interesting and it may be necessary, but not at a particular age. There are lots of different arguments out there. But the reason that I wanted to speak specifically about this one is because the question is, at what point do any side, does any side go too far? Like I examined in the last one, when the people that are in power right now are saying, hey, no, we need to be able to directly influence or at least say our piece and, you know, kind of flash our hammer in the background as to what's allowed on social media, we are limiting the frame of the conversation. Just as if you are limiting the books that are in schools, you are also limiting the frame of the conversation. And this in itself, if you agree on this issue, then you're not going to see it as a bad thing. But we need to step back because if this practice becomes normalized, if p people in um, more left-leaning areas start to say, okay, hey, well, no, we're not going to have To Kill a Mockingbird. We're going to make that standard now because it has racist undertones. Hey, if you don't like Hillbilly Elegy because it empathizes with uh, white Appalachian people who are poor and they're trying to push a very specific narrative, they may start banning or at least limiting those sort of books in schools. And... If you're a person who has fallen into this trap who says, yes, this specific part of the ideology of the other side I don't agree with, or I want to limit these books that are pushing that onto children, I want to limit that from being in schools, ask yourself if there is a line, if it's certain material that would go to a place that you would be okay with them, uh, you know, not necessarily talking about, but at least having the conversation, at least having the material there. So if a child's curious, say it's a, a book about um, what it was like to be a gay person in New York in the 1970s. So most people nowadays would probably be semi-okay with that. They probably wouldn't, they would be like, yeah, okay, you can read that if you're interested and it's a piece of historical fiction, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I want you to be talking about it. And there may be some lawmakers who are of an older generation or who just have a different point of view of you, and they're saying, no, 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 we don't want our kids to know anything about these uh, gay people. Or say it's about women's experiences in the 1920s before they had the, or uh, let's, let's take it back to like 1880 before they had the right to vote. And some lawmakers are saying, hey, well, no, actually, this is a perpetuation of certain left-wing feminist paradigm, so on and so forth, using a, an argument that could resonate with a lot of the base because they, they feel as though certain things aren't okay. But you're sitting there saying, well, no, actually, 
I think it's I think it's okay. I'd be okay with them reading. It doesn't mean I agree with everything they're saying, but I do think that they should be able to explore these sort of things, and I don't think it's going to be harmful. Now that you have opened the door, just as if we allow government agencies to open the door with communications with social media uh, websites, and they can have any type of communication they want, and they can just kind of say, oh, we don't think this is okay. And they may not be directly saying, no, that you can't, do uh, certain things on your own social media platform just as it's here it's not states aren't saying no you can't sell these books at all you just can't sell them in schools where does this slope end and i think that's what a lot of people on the left when talking about this issue they don't characterize it completely correctly they're trying to make it an anti-lgbtqia kind of thing which you can have that opinion if you think it's directly that sure but you should be making the even broader argument which is it is government restricting the framework through which we can have conversations if you can't read about these sort of things or certain experiences and let's be clear doesn't mean you have to agree with it but if you at least can't read it engage with it and break it down and understand where it's wrong and so on and so forth and you just simply block it out of your mind that is government intervention directly into your life not, I don't want to say manipulating, but changing the way through which you can see things. If you can't get certain information, then you can't even have a conversation about it. And where does that end? While, whether or not, like I said, whether or not you agree with this issue, I personally have lots of different mixed opinions on this issue. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because I don't want government getting more involved. If a community wants to make that decision, then they can make that decision. And I don't think it's up to any larger government, whether that be the state government, whether that be the federal government. Because you may be thinking, well, hey, that's the whole point of federalism. You can have these sort of policies enacted on a state level. Well, guess what? In Florida, Miami is probably a little bit more independent-minded. If you go to a, a place like Tallahassee, it might be a little bit more red. If you go to a place like Orlando, it might be a little bit more blue. All these different localities have different makeups demographically so let them decide why does it have to be to the top level of the state government because then the argument is well okay hey if you can extrapolate from these smaller populations to a general consensus to the larger population then guess what the same thing could be done on the federal level so i and i'm not trying to say that state governments are bad i'm not trying to say there isn't a purpose for federal government either it's just one of those questions where if you take the slippery soap fallacy and you just play it out because you're trying to have fun with it you can come up with scenarios where you're not comfortable with the amount of information or type of information that is being banned in your area in your state or in your country so it's just a serious thought process or at least a serious conversation that needs to be had on one side of the aisle, just like the other one I mentioned at the beginning is supposed to be had on the other side of the aisle. So let's jump to a one quote from this article that kind of highlights what's going on. And they once again use the language book banning, not a direct book ban, but so on and so forth. Quote, a recent Washington Post article about book banning in one Florida community offers an inadvertent testimonial to this truth, an oral history of sorts. The story consists of a long quotation by various residents of Excomba County from a tearful teacher who can't read a history book to her class without permission slip from a pastor who's totally glad that his activism caused book bad books to be removed from local schools. One source, a student, describes being raised very religious, the kind of Christianity that says you'll go to hell if you're gay. Then goes on to explain, and he goes on to explain a story, how he actually came around to a different point of view. He's uh, LGBTQI. He's actually, I'm, he says, I'm transgender and non-binary uh, because I don't identify with male or female. I feel like that's a contradictory terms, but that is not for me to decide. The point I'm trying to get at here is if you try to outright, and I'm not trying to say that they're suppressing, but if you try to pretend that what you're doing is something that everybody agrees with, you are going to get the testimonials from people who do not agree with you and they're getting put in these sort of articles. And if you feel that you are morally righteous and you are doing the right thing, go on Trump ahead. But then when you get frustrated when articles like this come out and there are people, even if it's just one person who disagrees, 
these sort of articles will pop up. They will use that one person as a political cudgel, and they will keep on telling their story in order to get a little bit of sympathy, in order to prove their point that not everybody agrees with it, it's not okay, so on and so forth. So political strategy-wise, I don't think that this is an issue that you really want to die on a hill for. I understand why it riles up the base, but when it comes to the independents, as I've mentioned before, the average American, even people on either side that have a particular base, there is a limit. And normally in America, that limit comes down to direct government infringement on your rights, your ability to exist the way that you want to exist. We are a very, we have a very specific ethos. And let's be clear, I've talked to a lot of people that don't have this ethos. But overall, when it comes to the things that we don't like, we definitely don't want government getting involved in our life about it. Even though there are plenty, let's be clear, there are plenty of people that I have talked to that say, no, 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 I'm all for more government involvement in our lives. But then you talk about a very specific issue that's very particular to them or very important to them, and you make a proposal that the government does something that they don't like, then of course they're going to say that they don't want the government involved in their lives. So, just try to make sure that the government is not as involved in people's lives as possible and you won't piss them off on either side of the aisle. So it's not a good strategy to go down things like this that rile up the base so much. Even if I, even if I would agree that it is morally right to remove things from these schools that are going to be damaging and harmful to children, that doesn't mean that it's a hill that you want to die on. Pass it, fight your fight, do it, and just get it done. You don't have to make a big deal out of it because guess what? If the people who like what you're doing, you get it done, they notice what you're doing, great. And then if you don't make a huge stink about it, then the people that don't like what you're doing won't even notice it. And that goes for both sides of the aisle. And let's be clear, the Biden administration was getting away with what they were doing too for a long time. They weren't publishing, publicizing it. And then it all came out in a few big leaks. And that is why it's a major story now. They were doing it on the low key, on the down low, and they weren't getting too much political hatred for it. There was always an assumption that it was happening, but there was no proof. And now they have the proof. So the political strategy, guys. I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> let's be clear. I'm not saying that the government should be doing any of this sort of stuff. I don't agree with it on a fundamental level and ideological level about what I see the role of government as doing. But as a person who also operates within the political world and makes commentary on it from a strategic standpoint, come on, guys. So let's jump to our next article. It's our last article. It's going to be a really quick one. I'm only going to read you one or two paragraphs, and it comes from PolitiZoom. The NRA isn't dead, but it's badly wounded. So I'm just going to read the first two paragraphs, like I said. Quote, don't for one second kid yourself that the NRA, especially as a political force, is dead or even dying. However, it is in the hospital, and if not in the ICU yet, it is in serious condition. While the NRA remains larger and still has more resources than all the other gun gobbler rights groups combined, they have been on a streak of about a year after a year revenue that has gone down and expenses that have gone up. Legal expenses keep knocking them down and backwards. The Daily Beast has an excellent article examining not just 15 years of tax filings, but another issue that has befallen the NRA. And uh, he makes a little bit of a sarcastic comment in here, which is, in quotes, he says, boo blanking who that it's fallen on the NRA. But the reason I thought this was an important article is because the NRA has been a centerpiece of uh, the conversation during my lifetime, for sure, especially as we've seen Columbine and we've seen all these different mass shootings come up. And the NRA has been the attacker, sorry, been the people that the left attack because they were always attacking them beforehand, but now they're starting to not do it as much. They're starting to have a wider conversation. When any of these big incidents happen, you don't necessarily see the R IRA, NR, sorry, NRA, not the IRA. That <laughs> We're not talking about the Irish people here. The NRA is not necessarily talked about as much. Now, is that because they're not as politically powerful, or is that because the Democrats realize it's not a worthwhile target? Or they just, people realize that the NRA isn't actually 
to blame for some of these things. I don't know what it is, but I did think it was funny or at least interesting that I didn't see a whole bunch of articles about them. And now we get a little bit of an explanation from Politizum, and they didn't say it in that first two paragraphs. I am kind of leading you on here, but it's an important one if you care about the nature of lobbying and the outside influence that groups like the NRA can have. Now, am I all for you having your Second Amendment rights? You bet. But does that mean that I want a lobbying group going out there and buying people? Or eh, that's probably a little salacious. Do I want the NRA going out there and influencing people's votes, inviting them to fancy soirees where they can meet other people of a like mind who may be willing to help them out on their next campaign and things like that? No, I don't like this idea. If somebody believes in the Second Amendment, they run on the Second Amendment, and the people vote for them on the Second Amendment, guess what? You have the full endorsement to protect Second Amendment rights, to expand Second Amendment protections, expand laws that help people secure uh, guns that are protected under the Second Amendment or repeal legislation that limits those protections, so on and so forth. You have that full endorsement. Do you really need the NRA in order to be there and lobby for you? Or, Or should I say, do you need a outside organization to use money to persuade people to be on their side rather than their principles or at least their core beliefs or at least beliefs that they hold in an auxiliary fashion. You may not be the most pro 2A person in the world, but if you still believe in it, you'll probably jump on to a lot of these bills. And does the NRA necessarily need to be there? Hey, let's be clear. People in Washington would probably argue yes, because you have to be funded in order to get things done. I'm, I'm not naive. I do understand that. But I would prefer that uh, lobbying is out of the way. And when I hadn't heard anything about the NRA in a while and I hadn't heard the, the favorite scarecrow that the Democrats love to hit when anything bad happens with firearms, I was intrigued. And if you're intrigued, go read this article. It's in the link in the description below that like and subscribe button. You can find all of the articles from today, including our next one, which is our daily delight, which it comes from Atla- Atlantis Obscura. And the headline reads, Years of Spectacular, Adorable, and Sometimes a Little Scary Animals. So they go on to a whole bunch of different animals here. But the one that I really wanted to highlight is really, really cool, in my opinion. Quote, Through the challenges of climate change, habitat loss, invasives, and more, groups of determined scientists were working to protect many of the dwelling species. These researchers and advocates brave harsh conditions, sharp teeth, and sleepless nights to study and conserve creatures that range from occasionally terrified down to the downright adorable. And the first animal they talk about, and the one that I want to talk about the most, is the elusive pink fairy armadillo. And Yes, if you haven't seen these guys, they have a little pink shell with fur underneath. Absolutely adorable. They live in little burrows. And, quote, even scientists had a hard time locating them. If you want to Google them, please do. They're phenomenal. Or if you just want to see any of the pictures here, like I mentioned, a link in the description below the like and subscribe button. And then if whenever you're down there, there's also a link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, as well as Podvine. Also down there is the Twitter handle, at Your Daily Flip, where I post a Twitter tirade every Tuesday and Thursday, less scripted, just kind of off the top of the head. Last week I did a little bit of a Atlas Shrugged kind of thing because I was uh, finishing up the book, so I wanted to explore some of the topics a little bit and also uh, what the value of a human soul is, so on and so forth. But those sort of like out of the way kind of topics. So if you want to enjoy that, go over to the Twitter handle, like I said, in the description. With all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.